so the project has been posted. Um, just to give you sort of a, a rough summary of what's involved, it's basically uh, you're basically so. Uh, step one is going to be integrating your uh, database system with uh, basically some minor extensions that you'll need to implement uh, functionality for uh, a fairly common database benchmark called TPCH, and this is. Uh, this is hopefully something you can complete in less than an afternoon. Um, it really is, is just the, the infrastructure from project one should be sufficient to get uh, the queries that are, are proposed running. Um, that's one thing. Uh, so, uh, thing number two is uh, to enable some sort of uh, basic query rewriting. Um, so there. Uh, Essentially, you're going to do some uh, fairly simple uh, analysis of query plans and transformation of those query plans into slightly more efficient ones. Uh, there's a little bit of code to help you with that, but again, most of the infrastructure that you, uh, that you need should be uh, largely in place. And then the final thing, which is probably going to be uh, the most code intensive, uh, maybe not necessarily the most conceptually intensive, but the most code intensive, is going to be to integrate that with your index structures. Uh, so part of those rewrites uh, should involve um, rewriting your code to take advantage of indices, uh, indexes to uh, do uh, index nested loop joins and um, in, uh, index scans rather than uh, standard uh, full table scans. Uh, so that's uh, basically project three. Oh, and uh, right the the. The extra credit for Project 3, um, if you, starting April 7th or whenever the first team submits, uh, whichever comes later, uh, I will be running bi-weekly uh, performance tests of all of the projects that have been submitted up to that point. And you can submit as many times as you like. Um, the top five teams uh, at every performance test will be awarded 15 extra credit points up to a total of 30 points uh, uh, bonus on the assignment. So uh, basically, if you submit fast, uh, you, are, you are in good shape to earn extra credits. And if you uh, build the fastest system, you are also in good shape to earn uh, that extra credit. So uh, that said, basically the, the assignment, and um, we'll be discussing it uh, early next week. So have a look at it, um, post questions to Piazza, and be ready with questions on Monday. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about transactions, and we've talked about recovery. Um, now we're going to move on to uh, another area where transactions are particularly useful. Um, a question. Uh, how do you take a database, the question of how do you take a database and partition it. So uh, just to give you, I'm sure most of you are already convinced that uh, par uh, parallel databases are a good idea, but just to give you some rough numbers to see how good an idea, um, if we want, so currently uh, SATA uh, revision 2 runs at about 300 megabytes per second per disk. Um, even revision 3, which I think is the latest, uh, runs at only about 600 megabits per second, uh, megabytes per second. So this uh, divide everything by two. Um, but if you want to scan one petabyte of data, that's going to take you uh, one hour. If you scale that out, if you spread that data over many disks and do that scan in parallel, uh, you can do the entire thing in about 3.5 seconds. Uh, that's that's a huge difference. Uh, three, uh, sorry, 3.5. Uh, seconds with a thousand disks. So uh, basically any sort of uh, parallelization that you can do uh, can dramatically speed up the performance of uh, the computations you're doing. Um, scaling up appears in a lot of different places. Uh, so uh, there are a whole bunch of these distributed databases. Uh, Teradata is sort of the canonical uh, database system that, that was sort of the first to really scale up dramatically. Uh, but there are some more recent ones. Uh, Green Plum and Dremel are, are two uh, systems. Dremel is uh, one out of Google uh, that does, essentially does SQL processing, uh, again, in, in seconds using 
thousands, uh, tens of thousands of machines at the same time. Um, H store is one based on uh, H base. So basically, lots lots of these distributed database systems. Um, I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with uh, system, systems like MapReduce. Um, there's a whole bunch of these these big data systems that are out there, um, and also there's uh, so we've been. It's not just a matter of storing data, it's also a matter of processing that data and, and managing it uh, in a consistent way. So there are a whole bunch of systems out there also that um, do transaction processing or something sort of like transaction processing uh, in, uh, a in a very distributed way. So basically people are doing this uh, distribution of data, um, it's, it's all over the place, and there's a really good reason for that. So, uh, show of hands, who's familiar with Moore's Law? Okay, good, good, Every, nearly everyone. Um, so basically, Moore's Law uh, traditionally has meant that processor speeds, uh, or technically it's, uh, Moore's Law was, uh, refers to the number of transistors on a chip, and the number of transistors doubles every 1.4 years. Uh, people have sort of previously taken that to mean that the processor speed uh, doubles every one and a, uh, one and a half years, uh, but that's basically due to uh, various physical limitations. Uh, that's not happening anymore. What we're, we're seeing now is uh, chips with more cores, more parallel processing capabilities. So in order to exploit uh, these these parallel processing capabilities, uh, you need basically techniques uh, to perform your queries in parallel uh, as as much as possible. Um, green energy is also sort of a big driving force at the moment, uh, and we're seeing a lot of these devices that in aggregate are faster, but that consume individually a lot less power, uh, and uh, together the, the total power usage of the system is uh, much lower. But again, you have lots of very sl uh, now you have lots of, of relatively slow devices that you need to combine uh, and exploit uh, in order to get parallelism out of them. So uh, basically this is a big challenge, is, is really what I'm trying to say. It's, it's something that's incredibly important, and um, databases are sort of a, a canonical case where uh, parallelism can be exploited uh, to the, the, the greatest extreme possible. And so today we're going to talk about uh, some various terminology. Uh, I'm going to define a couple of things and, and basically get us uh, prepared for a discussion of, of parallelism, and uh, hopefully I'll have time to squeeze in a couple of uh, descriptions of, of parallel data processing in a database. So uh, let me start out by sort of defining the, the two types of parallelism. Uh, so you can think of, of parallelism as uh, a way of combining uh, blobs of code, and each of those blobs of code defines some sequential uh, series of operations. Um, you can, there are basically two kinds of ways of combining these, these blobs of code. So you can take uh, blob, uh, the output of one of these blobs of code and feed it into another blob of code. And this is known as pipeline parallelism because you're essentially creating a pipeline of operations. Uh, the other way to do it is to take your data, split your data up, and execute each blob of code on each sequential blob of code on a different uh, piece of data. This is known as uh, partition parallelism. So, yes. A sequential operation how is it parallel? So the, the individual sequential operations are not parallel. So everything inside here is not parallel. But you're getting parallelism by uh, putting each of these blobs of code on a different device. So uh, one device. Uh, one computational device, uh, whether it's a core, a machine, uh, a hyperthread, one computational device uh, performs the, the operations in here and feeds its output to a different computational device, which performs uh, the second set of computations. Well, there's in this in the case of this example, there's only three. Uh, you only have three-way parallels. And in general, you're right. Uh, uh, pipeline parallelism usually has a much lower, uh, well, what I'll define in a moment is scale-out factor, uh, scale-out factor than uh, partition parallelism. Uh, 
Was does that address your concern or? I don't know. I don't see that as better than anything I need to do. Well, so if I have three computers, um, three cores, let's say, or three processors, I have one processor performing all of the computations in here. It reads a bunch of input, and as it is producing, uh, as it produces output, this chunk starts reading that input. Uh, look at this as, um, in fact, here. Um, one computer loads a bunch of data in, another computer uh, performs a filtering predicate, uh, applies a filtering predicate to that data. A third computer aggregates those, those values together. And then a fourth computer uh, combines the, the values from the aggregates together. The aggregate values together. Um, all of that can happen in, in, in parallel. As data is being loaded, it can immediately be fed into this filtering predicate. As that filtering predicate is being applied, it can be immediately uh, sent to the aggregate. The aggregate is blocking, so this uh, will have to wait until uh, the, the previous steps are done. But one of the, the primary things we've been trying to get across, uh, that I've been trying to get across at the, um, at the start of the, uh, the course, is this idea of, of pipeline operations. Uh, as you read the data in, uh, it goes immediately to the next stage of computation. And if you can do that, then you get some limited form of parallelism. parallelism. So that even inside parallelism is not exactly simultaneous computation? Uh, no, but if you have a, a I mean, again, if you're talking about, uh, let's say, a petabyte of data, um, even if you don't partition that data, uh, you read in the petabyte of data here, and, I mean, it's going to take you an entire hour to scan through the entire thing. So while there might be some stages where uh, you know, the, the first second or so, this node won't be doing anything. Uh, the first two seconds or so, this node won't be doing anything. Um, for the bulk of that hour, all of the nodes are going to be doing some form of computation. Um, slightly delayed, granted, uh, but... Uh, Basically, you're, you're, each of them is going to, for the bulk of the computation, each of them is going to be doing something. Okay, so uh, as it turns out, uh, both, of these parallel, both of these types of parallelism uh, appear very naturally in a database system. Uh, so if I have, uh, well, went over this example, but uh, so I've got pipeline parallelism because each operator is essentially a step in this pipeline. Uh, but at the same time, I can split the data across. And if, let's say, what I'm trying to compute is uh, just a single table scan with some condition, um, I can very easily take that, uh, that table, split it up into a hundred chunks or a thousand chunks, uh, apply the filtering predicate to the, the tuples in each chunk individually, and, and basically do all of these, these computations on each individual chunk uh, in parallel. So uh, essentially what this led to is this uh, databases were essentially sort of the first real uh, success story in parallelism. And uh, I'll be using the abbreviation of two uh, the, the parallel lines as uh, parallelism. Um, and literally every single major database vendor, Oracle, uh, IBM, um, Microsoft, has some form of parallelism uh, built into their major database systems, or has a, a partner uh, product that, uh, that does parallel computation. Um, and as I said, there's, there's sort of this natural, uh, this comes about because there's this natural uh, parallel uh, pipelining in the relational algebra plan, uh, but also because uh, all of the computation, there's, a, there's already this sort of natural partitioning strategy. Um, every data item is encapsulated in a tuple. And we can split those tuples very easily, uh, as opposed to, uh, for example, um, social network data, where you have lots of inter uh, intricate, uh, interrelated objects that have to er, point to each other. Um, and the other advantage is that the, the pipelining just come, falls out of the queries. Um, the user doesn't really need to write any, any sort of explicitly parallel uh, code, because a SQL query um, 
you can restructure that SQL query into a, a number of different forms, and uh, Query Optimizer can basically pick the form uh, that is most effective uh, for that particular query. Now, unfortunately, um, while databases were sort of the first success story, uh, they also sort of, uh, the, the, the sort of all-in-one databases have um, sort of failed at that, uh, at, at growing. Um, so typically, the, the, these large commercial database, uh, relational database systems um, generally don't scale past tens of nodes, and some of them will go up to, uh, uh, some of them will go up to hundreds of nodes, or maybe even a little bit more. Uh, but basically, uh, databases, uh, traditional all-in-one database systems have sort of uh, failed at this. And uh, basically, things to pay attention to when you're when you're actually trying to build uh, a parallel database system or a parallel uh, system that does data management. Um, the, basically, the reasons that they fail are that it, essentially they're trying to do too much. Um, SQL has become a very intricate, very complex language, and supporting all of it can be can lead to certain compromises that absolutely kill performance, uh, especially if you don't need those features. Um, one of one example of such a feature is consistency. So uh, databases have traditionally traditionally provided uh, this, the, the ACID guarantees that uh, I talked about last week. And um, typically providing ACID guarantees uh, is incredibly, incredibly expensive. Um, and this is, this is sort of more my opinion than anything else, but there's also this question of uh, the, the structure of the data. So relational databases typically have a very uh, strong, uh, strong consistency guarantee, uh, want users to place very strong consistency guarantees on their data. Uh, they, they like things like foreign keys and, uh, and, and well-structured data. And unfortunately, while that provides some very nice uh, query semantics, and while it's very nice for the users, certainly very nice for the database, um, it, all, it makes it very difficult to actually put data into the system. Um, you may have heard of something called extract transform load, or a process called extract transform load. Uh, we'll go over that uh, when we get to data warehousing. Uh, but essentially, there is a huge amount of effort that goes into just loading the data into the database. Um, and even before that, there's a whole amount of large amount of effort that goes into uh, manipulating the data, uh, sort of cleaning it, making sure that it uh, obeys the consistency guarantees in the first place before you before you can even load it into the database, and that requires a huge amount of human intervention. Which, uh, again, this is this is sort of my my view of things, but it it doesn't scale. Um, uh, yes. Ensuring the consistency before you can get that. So. Um, Consider, uh, so we, we talked about various consistency uh, constraints. Um, for example, not null. You want to make sure that a certain column is never null. Um, as we're going, uh, as we're loading a bunch of data, we may not have a particular value for, for a field. Um, maybe some user typed in, uh, Uh, purple as their age, as an example. Um, the database has no, no idea what to do with that. Um, it can put a null in that in the age field. It can put a zero in the age field. But both of those are, are strictly speaking, wrong. And you, uh, so basically, you end up with um, oftentimes what you want to do is apply those constraints when the query, when actually querying the data. So if the, even if the, the user's age is, is claimed to be purple, um, if you don't care about the user's age, then, or if the query never, never actually touches the user's age, then um, it doesn't matter. And so you, uh, what, I've, what we've been seeing a lot recently is uh, these the sort of unstructured databases where you, you can basically put data in and it will 
do its best to sort of organize and, and catalog that data, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't enforce very the, the strong uh, co data correctness guarantees on, on the data. Does that address your, your question? Okay, uh, so basically there's been a huge amount of effort to, to take databases and sort of figure out ways of, of making them parallel. And this is an extremely active area at the moment. Um, I am more than happy to talk about, uh, about specifics. Uh, for the, the purposes of this lecture, we'll, we'll be sort of more going on, on general principles. Uh, but if, if there's enough interest, I'm, I'm happy to put together a lecture on, on sort of what's, what kind of uh, techniques are being developed out there. Um, okay, so a little more terminology. Um, so there, there are two kinds of, of parallelism that we can get. Um, either speed up parallelism, where by throwing more resources at a problem, uh, we can make it go faster. Uh, so essentially we want to see this sort of uh, inverse linear curve if that happens, uh, where the response time uh, drops as uh, the inverse of the number of nodes that we throw at the problem. Uh, the other possibility is scale up parallelism, uh, where by throwing more nodes at the system, we may not necessarily be able to reduce uh, response time, but we can uh, add more nodes to the system and get better performance. And these are sort of the ideal curves uh, for each of these. Uh, typically, you won't see this kind of, of parallelism in a real system. Um, usually, there will be some sort of uh, cutoff in the throughput as you increase the number of nodes. Uh, and usually, you'll see uh, sort of uh, scaling that goes a little bit, uh, below that sort of speed up. Or, oh, sorry. The response time will, will sort of uh, hit some sort of threshold at some point and uh, won't decrease beyond that. But th this is sort of our ideal. Uh, we'd like to do one of these, by throwing more machines at the problem, we'd like to get one of these two benefits, or both. Okay, so, um, so this is what we're aiming for. How do we get there? Well, there are three, three sort of high-level uh, approaches to implementing parallelism that have been tried throughout the ages. Um, the first of these is what's known as a shared memory architecture. And um, there are a couple of examples of this. I'll get a couple on the next slide. Uh, but basically, you have a bunch of clients that are accessing a bunch of nodes. Each of these, these nodes has some compute power. And when, it does, when they do computation, uh, they access some sort of local memory. And that, that local memory is, uh, provides them with the illusion uh, that the, the same local memory exists on each of those nodes. Um, basically, when, when this node tries to read from some address in memory, uh, regardless of whether or not that ma address is actually stored in local memory, uh, the, the, the node will sort of contact uh, the, the, the memory basically gets shared across all of the nodes, and any node can access memory uh, that is, is in use by any other node. Now, this, there have been a number of implementations of this, uh, most of them by Sun and SGI in a, a number of academic efforts. Uh, and the, the, the real advantage of this is that it's incredibly easy to program. You basically just have one big memory block. Any processor is equivalent to any other processor. There's no sort of, basically there's no parallelism that you have to worry about. Uh, the downside, however, is that these tend to be extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, because you have to get, if you have uh, 50 nodes in, in, in one of these clusters, uh, you have to get data from one block of memory to another block of memory uh, extremely, extremely fast. And that's uh, something that is both expensive and extremely hard to scale. So uh, typically you don't see this kind of architecture all that much anymore. Um, and basically, the reason for that is that usually going past past the tens of nodes uh, is, is not really e economically feasible. Something that's a bit more common is uh, a shared disk architecture, where uh, every node has its own local storage, uh, 
Um, and any node can essentially read from uh, any other node's local storage uh, as well. Uh, so each node has its own memory, and any sort of computations uh, happen on that memory. And there's some sort of infrastructure for treating uh, the entire disk as one big data repository. Um, by the way, are there any questions up to this point? Okay. Uh, so you essentially you want to treat the entire data store as one big uh, one big disk or one big uh, storage mechanism. Uh, and there's a couple of examples of this. The, the most prominent is uh, HDFS or GFS. Those are underpinning infrastructure for MapReduce. Uh, it's not purely shared disk, but it's close enough. Um, and a whole bunch of EC2 uh, storage infrastructures, um, Peanuts is another example. Uh, basically, there's a whole bunch of these systems that give you, expose this one big uh, storage layer. Now, the advantage to this is that you can program, um, you get some of the advantages of uh, the, the shared memory architecture. Uh, because you're, you're sharing a disk, uh, you can program locally without really considering any sort of parallelism. Uh, sorry, you can uh, access the disk without really having to consider any sort of parallelism. Um, on the other hand, you still have to sort of uh, find some way of, of partitioning your, your task. You still have to find uh, you still have to explicitly consider uh, when you're going to be executing these sort of long-running operations. Um, on the other hand, that's still simpler than the next architecture that I'm going to uh, suggest. So uh, this is this is still pretty reasonable. Uh, it's also difficult to provide um, guarantees, uh, uh, consistency guarantees on top of this. Uh, so typically, uh, people will uh, do slightly different. So the difference between uh, this and this? Oh, uh, I'll get into this a bit more when I describe eventual consistency. But the um, loosely speaking, strong consistency is acid as I described it. Uh, weak consistency is. Um, basically some sort of relaxation of, of acid. And the most common one is, uh, is called eventual consistency. Uh, the, the sort of, the view of eventual consistency is that when you do a read, you may not necessarily get a consistent result. However, um, the guarantee it does provide is that by re-executing certain operations or uh, by doing something else, um, eventually, if if no no new operations come into the system, basically once the once the uh, system finishes processing all of its local transactions, um, the the state of the system that you read will be consistent. Does that make sense? So basically, as long as the system isn't processing any sort of transactions, it's guaranteed to end up in some consistent state. But while it's processing transactions, you may end up uh, seeing some data that you shouldn't be seeing or that you shouldn't be seeing yet. OK. Um, right, so then the, the final approach is to share absolutely nothing. Uh, so in this. In this particular setting, uh, the entire programming stack, uh, the entire memory hierarchy uh, is, is completely isolated. All of the communications are, uh, are done explicitly by the code that's um, by, by sort of the, the software. Uh, all, all of the communications have to be done entirely in software. So basically in this example, all of the communications handled by, uh, are handled by the, the memory. This example, the file system sort of handles all of the communications, whereas uh, in a shared nothing architecture, all of the communications have to be explicitly coded into, into the system. Um, now this basically gives us the most uh, flexibility in that whatever we program um, ends up 
because we have control over how that uh, program gets executed, uh, we know exactly uh, how to optimize it uh, for our specific use case. On the other hand, that makes it, uh, oh, uh, and there's also no infrastructure support required. You get a thousand PCs and you have a thousand node cluster. Um, there's there's no, no special hardware that you need. On the other hand, um, this is incredibly difficult to program because you need to explicitly consider uh, how data is, is getting shipped back and forth. On the other hand, it's typically possible to provide strong consistency even for very large numbers of, uh, of uh, processing components. And uh, a good example of this is, is sort of the MapReduce architecture, which explicitly has, uh, explicitly manages uh, communication between each of the phases. So we'll, we'll cover MapReduce in a little more detail, uh, hopefully if we have time. Uh, but basically, it's this sort of pipeline architecture where it explicitly uh, handles its own communication between the pipeline stages. Okay. Um, so this is basically uh, an overview of the underlying architectures. If you were to write a database right now, um, you'd basically look at the advantages and, and trade-offs of each of these and basically pick one of these architectures uh, to, to implement your database on top of. Um, typically users will be inter implementing with some sort of, uh, interacting with some sort of software written on top of one of those architectures. <coughs> Right, so where does parallelism come from in a database management system? Um, so there are basically three kinds of, of general parallelism that we can uh, exploit. Uh, the first is, uh, well, uh, query breaks down into a whole bunch of relational algebra operators, and each of those operators is a separate, independent computational chunk. Um, so we can exploit um, parallelism between those operators. We can deploy each of them to a separate uh, compute node. And this is something that happens very frequently in stream processing, which once again we'll, we'll uh, discuss a bit further in the class. Um, inter so we also have intra-operator parallelism. So certain operators can be very easily distributed. So for example, uh, select. Uh, the select operator uh, can be very easily partitioned across a number of different uh, compute devices. And finally, we can uh, execute lots of queries in parallelism. And this is, uh, we discussed a bit about uh, this when we talked about transactions. Um, basically, we can have lots of queries running at the same time, and uh, that's another source of parallelism. Uh, so we already discussed inter-query parallelism. We are, um, Intra-operator uh, inter par parallelism is something we'll discuss a bit further when we get to stream processing. Um, so what we're going to focus on uh, over the course of the next 10 minutes or so uh, and the next lecture is uh, parallelism between different operators. Oh, sorry, between uh, parallelism within individual operators. Now the, the first thing we need to uh, the first thing we need to um, think about when we, we try and partition an operator is how do we if we're if we're trying to partition the, uh, to uh, execute the operator uh, in parallel on different chunks of the data how do we create those chunks how do we split the data up uh, between lots of, of different values and there are, uh, this this probably sounds a little familiar from um, our discussion of uh, various join algorithms and index structures. Um, but basically, there are sort of three, three high-level uh, strategies. So you can do uh, range partitioning. Take your uh, data and come up with a couple of separator values, uh, split and split the data uh, based on those separator values. Um, you can do hash partitioning, so exactly like you do a hash join or a hash, uh, hash index. Partition the data uh, into bins that way. Or you can basically just do an arbitrary assignment. Uh, data value one goes to the first node, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and so forth. Um, 
So basically one of the uh, bunch of strategies for doing it. Um, when would you want to do range partitioning? When would you want to do range partition? Um, okay, uh, so when you want to do, well, uh, so like what kind of an operator? For okay, so when you want to do uh, an equality predicate on a data set. Okay, that's one, str uh, one thing. Uh, could you do that with hash partitioning as well? No? Why? Why not? You can. You can. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if you're doing an equality, if you're doing an equality check uh, test, you know what uh, what your what value you're trying to look up. You can just go to that one node. Um, could you do that with round robin? Um, yeah, well, how, how would you implement it? Yeah, so you can't do, uh, so in order to implement uh, round robin, you'd essentially have to run the equality check on every single individual node. Um, So what about uh, what? Um, can anyone think of a good situation where you would actually want to do? Round robin is a special hash. Um, it's non-deterministic. So if uh, if the first uh, a tuple could just as easily be the first tuple that gets received by the round robin uh, partitioner, or it could be uh, the tenth tuple. We're not defining any explicit order on the data here. Even if we do define an explicit order, um, inserting new tuples would change that would change that order. So if a, if a tuple gets assigned to the third node, for example, and I insert two tuples before it, then the next time around it would get assigned to the, the fifth node. So it's not precisely hash indexing. So with a hash, with a hash. Um, uh, if, if I were using a, a hash partitioning scheme, then the, the tuple would go to uh, always go to the same exact node, regardless of anything else. Well, it, uh, assuming I had the, uh, the same number of, of partitions that I was creating, um, it would uh, the the tuple would always go to the same partition. Um, you don't have that guarantee with round robin. So maybe a, a different way of asking that question. Uh, what is, can anyone see a disadvantage of hash partitioning and range partitioning that you won't have with round robin? Overloading. Sorry? Overloading of the uh, Over, Okay, uh, could you be more a little, uh, a little more explicit? Round robin basically provides the introduced of data to open So Sorry, uh, could, uh, could you be quiet? Um, speak up? So round robin provides the equal distribution of data from the node. So if the data is so large, if there is some range or some edge, the code will be overloaded in the round robin. Exactly. So um, round robin will will put exactly the same same number of well, to within one uh, to with one to within one tuple exactly the same number of uh, tuples on each machine on each node. Uh, whereas with hash partitioning and range partitioning you're not guaranteed to get any specific number of values on any node. Um, and in general, you'll, you'll have a pretty wide variation with hash partitioning. Um, could you do something similar with range partitioning? Yeah, you can divide the, you can divide the range. Okay, so you can pick ranges that, um, that involve, you can pick equal size ranges. Uh, what does that involve? Okay, so you need to know uh, you need to know exactly where to put those partition boundaries. Um, what's uh, let's say you have a petabyte of data. Um, 
do you want to scan the entire thing all at once? Okay, so you can you can use round robin. Um, okay, we'll we'll get back to range partitioning in, in uh, either in a couple of slides or on uh, Friday. Yes. So hash uh, hash function is not guaranteed to get. It will give you an expected uniform distribution of values but that expected distribution has a variance on it. So you may get some nodes, uh, even, with, with ha even with a good, a strong hash function, you're likely to get some nodes that have no data on them, and some nodes that have uh, twice, the, twice the size of, twice the average. Not many of them, but if you're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, then a one in a thousand <coughs> chance you, will happen. But you can add an uh, insert one, well, then your uh, so then your your hash function is then you need to know more information about the hash function. So you can there are definitely schemes that you can apply on top of a hash partitioning scheme. You can uh, you can do something along the lines of extendable hashing, for example. Uh, I guess what I should say is this: this is sort of the, the the high level, a high level set of schemes that you can start from. Um, each of them has individual advantages and disadvantages, and there are uh, an in, a practically infinite number of, of more complex schemes that you can develop on top of these. Uh, does that address your, your concern? Okay. Um, All right, so we're running out of time. Um, I don't. Yeah, uh, we'll we'll resume with um, various implementations of scan operators on Friday. So that uh, any questions? All right, uh, look at the project. Come come in with any questions you have on that uh, Friday. We'll go over it officially formally on uh, Monday.